Hey guys, today I'll be installing the E3 CNC router from Bob CNC. Now, this will be kind of a long video, so I'll probably do time lapse through most of it. But if there's any troubleshooting that needs to be done, uh, I'll stop and we'll record that and I'll work out any issues that I have. So if you guys are building one, you kind of have an idea of what to look for. Now, if you just want to see it in action, fast forward to the end of the video and you can see that working. But this should give you an idea, if you're putting one together, of what to look for. So, with that said, let's get started. When your CNC arrives, you'll notice a checklist of verification making sure all your parts are inside. While there are other CNC's in the market, it's hard to beat the price at $677. The outstanding customer service you receive from Bob himself to make sure you get it up and running is worth every penny. This is a family owned business and they laser cut the parts and assemble them here in the United States. Bob presently holds a 5 out of 5 stars on Amazon for the E3 CNC machine. Their over the top customer service and Bob's very impressively designed CNC machine is quickly making traction in the maker world. After receiving your CNC, one of the first things you're going to need to do is go over to BobCNC.com. There you'll find a link for an E3 CNC router. On this page, you'll find assembly instructions, quick start guide, and troubleshooting guide. On the assembly instructions, one of the very first things it suggests is giving your CNC router a protection, either painting, staining, or clear coating. In this case, I used lacquer on mine. I used painter's tape to protect the threads on the hold down holes from getting gummed up. I was afraid spraying lacquer on the MDF spoil board might warp or puff the board, but light coats of lacquer showed no signs of destruction. I quickly realized I didn't have something large enough to lay all my pieces on so I could polyurethane them. So I grabbed the box that came in and sliced both edges down the sides. Next I attached the box with some screws to some old boards so I didn't end up with a cardboard kite. I chose a Minwax polyurethane spray, which I highly recommend over brushing it on. It was simple to spray all the pieces and it dried very, very quickly in the sun. I gave these pieces three coats of polyurethane in a one day's time. I then let them sit overnight to dry and the next day I sanded them with 220 grit sandpaper. I then organized them by shape back in their box, which was awesome for assembly speed later. One of the first instructions is to put this bolt together. You're asked to tighten it, but not over tighten it. Bob mentioned this is one of the top things he sees a lot. I used two wrenches to tighten mine, but as soon as I saw the rubber washer start to frog cheek, I backed it off until it was back to normal size. Mine never gave me an issue. Now I've updated Bob with the mistakes I made during my install so he can work to improve the assembly manual. Your first goal is to use the M4 screws to attach these pieces of wood together. The proper way is to place the nut in the slit rather than the head of the bolt like I did. Placing the nut in the hole allows you to only have to tighten with a screwdriver and a wrench won't be needed. Let's take a look at how I've assembled it. The screw goes on the bottom here and that nut goes inside the slit. That will save you a lot of time because I did it wrong and this will save you from doing that wrong as well. Now taking the router apart was worrying me a little. If the black end comes off the router after you disassemble it, the brushes can fall out. I typically don't get things back together correctly when this happens, but I was careful in keeping it in place and didn't have any issues. When placing the router in the newly built frame you just made, reference the cord position rather than the logos on the router. Dewalt has recently updated the router's logos and they don't actually face the same way as it did in the pictures. This is the correct position that your router cable should be facing. I highly suggest purchasing a little magnetic tool like this one to place the nuts in the slits. Bob had never heard of anyone using something like this before, but there are a few times you'll need to get into tight spots and this was an amazing tool to have. The router housing was complete and it was time to move on to the next step. Okay, so here's a tip when uh, putting your motor on. This piece, don't even tighten it down until you've actually got it on here. So slip it on the end of the shaft and then slip it onto the end of the threads and it'll save you a lot of time. Then tighten it down once it's in this piece because uh, you'll tighten it down and it'll be in the wrong spot. Now it's time to get the sides on, and if you notice in the center of those boards there's squares. That's for making adjustments later.
The magnet tool was working so well, I wanted to work in another image showing you up close of what it looked like. The directions say to take these screws up to snug and then one and a half to two turns past that. This little piece of wood was accidentally put in upside down. It holds the controller and you zip tie to it. The two little holes need to be at the bottom of the gantry instead of the top like I did here. Here you get a better chance of looking at the piece and see how I incorrectly put the holes at the top instead of the bottom. There was this one screw while installing the gantry that it helped to have a bent screwdriver if you have one lying around. The rollers with the larger hole won't need to be tightened down at this stage as they'll need to be adjusted to get onto the rail. At the time I did this install, the picture was hard to tell that there was an extra nut on this bolt. You'll have three of these bolts that have two bearings, a nut, and a washer. Make sure to label your cords as later you'll be wrapping them and you won't be able to tell where they're going. After installing the two homing switches, you'll realize you have one more homing switch. This will actually be used later on, so set it aside. With a little bit of jiggling and wiggling, I was able to get the gantry down onto the frame. The instructions call for two rods to be installed into the frame. Now then, you'll be using the long rods and the two short ones will be used later. In the diagram, you can see that the SG-20 bearings that are attached to the gantry right on top on the top rod and the ones on the bottom right underneath it. This is just a look at one side of the gantry and the opposite side will be done the same way. I found the steel rod for the gantry to be pretty tight. I supported each piece it entered as I softly tapped the rod. When it comes to wrapping the wires, Bob has provided you with a great length of spiral wire wrap. It's up to you on creativity of the look, but when it comes to the Z stepper motor on top of the gantry, you'll need to wrap the cord like I've shown here to help prevent false readings. The homing switch wrapped one time and then five times around the stepper motor cable and then again one wrap around the homing switch and so on. As you're zip tying down the stepper and homing switch cables, Make sure you still have a full range of motion back and forth. Installing the belts sounds tricky, but it's really not. If you look at the sketch I made, you'll see the belts get pinched at the front of the CNC. Then the belt runs grippy side down over the idler pulley, then wraps downward around the idler pulley and then over the standard pulley. Then it gets pinched on the other side of the CNC. Here's a quick clip showing how to do this. Okay. So if you look in here, you can see the, uh, the idler here, and then here's your pulley. Now then, with your V-belt, with the V-grippy side down, run it over top of that idler, pull it back underneath it, then go over top of that pulley, and then pull it tight. And that's how you do it. All three belts are the same length, but you'll find that you have excess left over on two of those belts, those being the ones on the sides of the CNC. I zip tied them tight and then gave myself a little wiggle room and snipped off the excess. When securing the belt on the gantry at both ends, you'll slip the belt perfectly into these laser cut pieces of wood. Now it's not going to slide like butter, so this is the point where you'll need a set of needle nose pliers and some patience. It's a tight fit. Work the very end of the belt into the piece with the pliers. Only half of it will go in. Now holding the belt with a finger, work the other end with the needle nose pliers. I found on my second piece of laser cut wood that I had a splinter inside that little cut. I used a razor blade to remove this and then used a flat screwdriver for a little bit of prying to help me get it to go on in. After attaching your spoil board to the bottom, it's time to mount the controller with the zip ties. The diagram shows here the layout of where you plug in your cables. And that is pretty much it for things to look for when installing your E3 CNC engraver. The next thing you need to do is follow the instructions Bob has laid out on testing, F-engrave, and G-code. 
I had to reference the troubleshooting guide as my stepper motors ran the wrong way when I clicked home. The troubleshooting guide recommended I flip the stepper cable motors for X1 and X2. Once I did that, the CNC correctly homed. But let's face it, we all want to see what this thing can do. So I've time-lapsed some of the things I've made over the past couple days just for this video. It took me five times of watching Bob's videos to make me feel comfortable enough to turn it on and make that first cut. I filmed this build video as I assembled it, so my build time may be a little longer than yours. I started at 9 a.m. and quit at 12 a.m. I spent about two hours the next day finishing the build. The actual build itself wasn't hard, but it did take some time to put together. I advise you assemble it indoors in a comfy chair over a two-day period. It's highly likely you'll have your CNC up and running in a few days after assembling it. The quality this thing can produce is pretty amazing. I had to email Bob for troubleshooting a few times because F Engrave wasn't allowing me to make a cut. His quick response and outstanding willingness to help is for sure an added bonus for choosing the E3CNC. There aren't very many videos on F Engrave or G Code. Look for my next video where I show you how to fix the settings in F Engrave that prevents your CNC from being able to cut. I'll show you the best speeds, depths of cuts, and overall how to use your new E3CNC engraver for the first time.